Tonight, we're going to be talking about something that will be particularly of importance for those who are uh, wondering about the economic situation facing America, uh, as well as for young people. Uh, this is going to be uh, uh, something where we're talking about um, uh, the aspects of the economy and what uh, results in true happiness and how we can have a surety uh, even in uncertain times. And also in regards to decision making, how to make the right decision uh, at the right time, uh, even when it comes to things like finances or education or even the pursuit of a marriage partner. And so be sure and come at 5 o'clock. Also, we're going to be telling you some exciting things that are going on at Weimar. Uh, the Weimar campus is growing significantly, and uh, we'd like to uh, see if you'd be willing to partner with us at Weimar, not from a financial standpoint, although we can always uh, use uh, uh, money for the Lord's work at Weimar, but partnering in, in another uh, way in particular. And so uh, be sure and uh, come at 5 o'clock, invite every young person. I can guarantee you after the message, if you're here, you're going to wish that you would have invited some other young people that needed to hear the message. So uh, uh, be sure and, uh, and uh, come at 5 o'clock. Today we're going to be talking about wisdom. Wisdom is the comprehension of what is true or right coupled with optimum judgment as to action. So first you have to discern what is true, what is right, and then it has to be coupled with optimum judgment in putting that into action. One of the reasons why the scripture is filled in regards to wisdom. When it comes to wisdom, one of the texts that comes to mind is Revelation 22 verse 4, and they shall see his face, says John. And you know what the rest of the text is? His name shall be where? In their foreheads. And of course, in the forehead and right behind the forehead is what secular neurologists tell us is the crown of the brain. Scientific studies show us that the frontal lobe is the seat of spirituality, morality, and also the will. This is our decision maker but it's also the area where worship occurs uh, and uh, spirituality. In fact, there are some people who are uh, of a non-religious persuasion, and they might get the idea that somehow they're not spiritual. Every human being worships because they have a frontal lobe. The difference is who they're worshiping, what they're worshiping, but every human being, because they have a frontal lobe, has that capacity to worship and actually does worshipful activities. Even atheists do worshipful activities uh, that uh, even um, uh, exemplify faith uh, and things that are uh, present there in the frontal lobe of the brain. But as Christians, of course, who believe in God, uh, the frontal lobe is of utmost importance to us. Now, there are other lobes of the frontal lo of the brain. There's the temporal lobe. This is where our memory is centered. You can have an excellent memory and not have a very good functioning frontal lobe. You can even have a photographic memory and still not necessarily have a good functioning frontal lobe. These two are not uh, always connected, uh, per se. The temporal lobe is also where our musical abilities are at. When we were listening to that music, it was actually going through the ear and going first through the temporal lobe of the brain. It's one of the reasons why the Lord wanted us to put scripture into music so we would be able to remember the scripture. Uh, it's part of the memory aspect of things. It's much easier to remember it when you put it into song. Uh, and of course, uh, there's other advantages uh, to the song part as well. The occipital lobe is where our architectural skills are at. Now, I saw uh, when we were introducing the visitors this morning, uh, that uh, we have a, a very famous architect uh, that's with us uh, here today, um, Hani, and uh, he has uh, devised a lot of master planning for, um, uh, for the, the monarchs in the Middle East and has done a lot of work in regards to architect. But when he's doing his architectural um, uh, work, it requires that occipital lobe, that ability to visualize, uh, et cetera. 
we're fortunate uh, that um, he has donated his time to be the master planner at Weimar. And uh, when we talk to uh, a little bit tonight, um, I'm actually going to have Hani uh, come up and show you a little bit about what is happening at Weimar from the architectural standpoint. There are some people that are blessed with a more, um, uh, a larger occipital lobe. My wife happens to be one of those. She's not a trained architect. She's a physical therapist. But when it comes to being able to visualize how a building should be done, uh, or renovated, et cetera. Um, she can have that vision. She can go to the architect and say, this is how we're going to do it, this way, this way, that way, et cetera. And she can just see that as a result of that occipital lobe. Occipital lobe, of course, has something to do with IQ or intelligence. Parietal lobe is where your calculation, your math, division, subtraction occur. It's also where uh, sensation occurs. Um, Einstein gave his brain to science, and Einstein had a little larger parietal lobe than most other human beings. Uh, the cerebellum is where our coordination is centered. Uh, and this is how you're able to perform athleticism with precision and grace. Uh, and there are some creatures that have much better developed cerebellums than what we have. Uh, and uh, they're more graceful in athleticism uh, than we are. But what sets us apart from those animal creatures is our frontal lobe size. The frontal lobe is very large in human beings, much larger than it is in any other creature. Uh, cats have a brain, but only 3.5% of a cat brain is in the frontal lobe. Not much morality in a cat. If you've uh, seen it torture its victims to death and seem to enjoy the process of the torture. That's just due to that very small frontal lobe size. Dogs have a little more frontal lobe. 7% of a dog's brain is in the frontal lobe. Uh, dogs won't hesitate to murder if they have to, so they don't have very large frontal lobes, but they do it much more mercifully. They're able to um, actually empathize with other creatures, to be able to understand a little bit about how they're feeling, uh, et cetera, because of their larger frontal lobe size. Uh, chimpanzees have the most of any other animal creature. 17% of their brain is in the frontal lobe. But what sets us apart from the rest of the animal kingdom is our frontal lobe size. 33 up to 38% of the human brain is in the frontal lobe. And this is what gives us the ability to accomplish advanced planning and thinking, uh, to be able to choose our own destiny. I think this is what the Lord was talking about when he said, let us make man in our image that has that uh, large frontal lobe ability. There are, of course, effects of compromised frontal lobes that have been well documented now in the scientific literature. When the frontal lobe is diminished in human beings in circulation or in activity, there's an impairment of moral principle that occurs. If we want to follow the decline in morality, in a particular group of people or a particular nation, you have to follow that decline as a result of the decline in frontal lobe function that is occurring. It's very directly related. When the frontal lobe is compromised, even social impairment occurs. There's a loss of love for family that it can occur. It's natural to love your, your brothers, sisters, parents, um, children. If that natural love for family is gone, it's really due to a problem in the frontal lobe of the brain. Lack of foresight, our ability to reason from cause to effect is a frontal lobe function. But how far we're planning in the future is very much a frontal lobe function. You can follow your child's frontal lobe development by how far he's looking to the future. You know, when, I, when Justin, who's now eight, who is watching here today, was five years old, and it was a Wednesday, I could tell him something was going to happen on Sabbath. And some of the times, he wouldn't even necessarily remember. Sabbath came. If I didn't remind him, it was kind of lost to him. He didn't have the ability to think that far in advance. Well, uh, now he knows what grade he's going into uh, the next year, even though it's months before he's going to go into that grade. And uh, soon he'll be uh, uh, actually, hopefully his frontal lobe will develop, well, he'll be planning wisely for his career, his marriage partner, etc. When we get very short-sighted in our decisions, it's a frontal lobe problem. And so we need to have that frontal lobe there to have that lengthier aspect of things. And hopefully we can realize that our decisions that we're making today can actually have eternal consequences. 
Uh, the abstract reasoning is impaired. Our ability to interpret proverbs is a frontal lobe function. And uh, you can also follow your child's frontal lobe development when he's in high school, et cetera, to see how that abstract reasoning kicks in. Often, it's a difficult uh, process. And uh, you know, recently, I um, was in Texas at a large um, high school, public high school, and they had me speak for career day uh, there. This was one of these high schools where there's thousands of kids, and they have policemen in the aisles, et cetera. It's a huge um, intercity. Um, high school, and I asked one of the kids, or not one of them, I asked all to interpret a proverb. It's an English proverb. It says, people that live in glass houses should not throw stones. Have you heard that proverb before? So I asked the kids, what does that proverb mean? One kid in the front came up to the microphone and he says, if you do that, you'll break your house. Now that's called concrete reasoning. That's not what the proverb means. And so I asked uh, again, and another student, many students, several students came forward, all saying a variation of the same thing. And finally, one kid in the back came up and went to the microphone, and he says, what that proverb means is if you don't want to be picked on, you better not pick on somebody else. Now, that's his teenage vernacular, but that was the abstract interpretation. That was the correct interpretation. I then asked them the question, how many of you think your parents would have gotten that proverb right? What percent of the kids do you think raised their hands in a high school in the inner city in Texas? I, I was surprised, but about 90% of them raised their hands. I said, you know what, you're right. I think your, ki your parents would have been able to interpret that proverb. And the reason why is because their frontal lobe is a lot more developed than yours. And if you were not able to interpret that proverb, there's a whole lot of other things that you have no clue about. And so you really need to depend upon your parents' wisdom until your frontal lobe is fully developed. Now, do you know how long it takes the frontal lobe to be developed in human beings? 30 years uh, before it completes its development. And so uh, I think there was a reason why the Levites were not able to function as priests until they were 30, why Christ did not begin his ministry until 30, uh, waiting for that frontal lobe to be fully uh, developed. So just because the, the 18 or 20 year old looks like they're adults, uh, in reality, uh, you need to recognize they're adult size, but they're not adult brain. Uh, and uh, the good news is, is that even though um, they're pretty immature in their actions, there is hope for them, obviously, because their frontal lobe can still develop uh, and uh, go beyond that. Mathematical understanding is diminished in people with compromised frontal lobes. Things like calculus and higher forms of algebra become quite difficult. Empathy very much is related to frontal lobe function. Now, there are some people with low frontal lobe function that believe empathy is not possible. But it is possible. Empathy means that you have the ability to understand and completely feel what someone else has gone through even though you haven't gone through it yourself. Now it's true, you can only have that empathy if that frontal lobe is fully intact. And so uh, that's one of the other important aspects of the frontal lobe of the brain. When the frontal lobe is compromised, there's also a lack of restraint, boasting hostility, loss of temper, et cetera, uh, become much more common as a result of the frontal lobe being compromised. Now, there are ways that we can damage our frontal lobe besides just accidents uh, and, uh, and trauma. We can uh, damage it through uh, drugs, illicit drugs, amphetamines, cocaine, narcotics, marijuana. They all have something in common. They all cause a suppression of the frontal lobe of the brain. Some prescription drugs also uh, can adversely affect the frontal lobe of the brain, so we have to weigh the benefits versus the risks uh, in those cases. There are legal drugs that also damage. Uh, alcohol uh, affects the frontal lobe of the brain first before it affects any other portion of the brain. Uh, and this is why um, even when you're driving at the legal limit, studies show you're 10 times as likely to get into an automobile accident even though you're legal. Now, it's not because your coordination is down. Studies have also been done on baseball players who have had a drink of alcohol before they get up to bat. And if they're at the legal limit, they're actually able to hit a curveball out of a baseball park successfully. 
their cerebellum is not adversely affected yet. So why is it that those same baseball players are 10 times as likely to get into an automobile accident? It's their judgment that's off. And that's what happened to Princess Di's driver. No one recognized he was drunk, but yet he attempted to negotiate a turn in a tunnel at a speed that was impossible to negotiate, even under the best of coordinated circumstances. And thus he lost his life and others lost their life as well. Nicotine has a more subtle effect on the frontal lobe of the brain. And uh, this is a, uh, the most commonly consumed drug in America also has an adverse effect on the frontal lobe of the brain. Does anyone want to guess what the most commonly consumed drug is in America? It's also the most commonly consumed drug in Romania. It ends in an INE uh, because it is a drug. Uh, caffeine is a drug and it blocks the adenosine receptors in the frontal lobe of the brain. Uh, this um, can cause issues in regards to even judgment. Uh, Pavlov studied typists under the influence of caffeine. They can type a little bit faster, but they make 10 times as many errors. Uh, and uh, even the National Football League quarterback coaches have started to tell their quarterbacks to consume zero caffeine. Now, the linemen are not told to consume zero caffeine. The linemen between plays are drinking caffeine beverages to try to sack that quarterback. It seems unfair that the quarterback is told to consume no caffeine. Why is it that the quarterback's told to consume zero caffeine? Who is it that needs to have the frontal lobe? Is it the lineman or is it the quarterback? Who's making the decision? The decision is being made by the quarterback on what to do with the ball, and it's much more important that that decision-making portion of the brain be unaffected that he's able to analyze that information and make the appropriate decision. Now, it's kind of interesting. I've seen sometimes where the quarterback just steps a little bit to the side, and that lineman goes flying and is out of the play. It makes me wonder whether the lineman coaches will also come up to speed, uh, be able to do that, because having that caffeine decreases the breaking ability on human behavior. And that's what Ellen White talked about when she mentioned this. It's now been proven by science. Did you know caffeine increases your likelihood that you will gossip? <laughs> Studies show that if you, are, if you have consumed caffeine and you're in a social situation, you're much more likely to share private information with someone who's not part of the problem or part of the solution to the problem. That is the definition of gossip. Then if you don't have caffeine on board, and interestingly, uh, years ago, Ellen White said, when these tea and coffee users meet together for social entertainment, the effects of their pernicious habit are manifest. All partake freely of their favorite beverages, and as the stimulating influence is felt, what happens? Their tongues are what? Loosened. And they begin the wicked work of talking against others. Their words are not few or well chosen. And that underscores another important area of the frontal lobe of the brain. The frontal lobe is an appropriate break on human behavior. Now, I know in an audience this size, and I know the fact that you live in America and came from Romania, there has to be a lot of people here that consume caffeine beverages on a regular basis. And what many of these people think is, well, even though caffeine might have some harm, in my case, it's actually necessary. Because without it, I would be a zombie, I wouldn't have the energy, I wouldn't be able to do the things that I do, and in my case, it's just necessary. Well, a recent study was done uh, in response to this by Bristol Universities, and it showed that caffeine addiction is such a downer that regular coffee drinkers get no real pick-me-up from their morning habit. What? I thought that's why they're using it. Bristol University researchers found that caffeine beverage drinkers develop a tolerance to both the anxiety producing and the stimulating effects of caffeine, meaning that it only brings them back to baseline levels of alertness, not above them. This was a very carefully controlled trial, prospective placebo control, that's a gold standard trial, 379 adults. Although frequent consumers feel alerted by caffeine, especially by their morning tea, coffee, or other caffeine-containing drink, evidence indicates that this is actually merely a reversal of the fatiguing effects of acute caffeine withdrawal. 
wrote the scientist, less by Peter Rogers. Measurements showed that caffeine users' post-caffeine levels of alertness were actually no higher than non-caffeine consumers who received a placebo, suggesting caffeine only brings coffee drinkers back up to normal. In other words, all the reported benefits of caffeine are present virtually all day, only in those who don't consume it. And so if you want to be more alert throughout the entire day, you will actually go through caffeine withdrawal so that you can start uh, actually being alert without this beverage, and you'll actually be much more alert throughout the entire day. Now, I know that's going to involve some headaches for maybe two or three days. It may involve feeling like a zombie for a little while. But I think it will be well worth the effort, particularly in regards to the frontal lobe. And this was published in Neuropsychopharmacology, June 10 of 2010. This goes along with what Peter said. Peter said, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. In other words, he's saying, help your mind become as alert as possible. Do whatever is possible uh, to help that brain be more <laughs> effective. Gird up the loins. And then he says this, be what? Sober. Now that Greek word, be sober, actually doesn't mean sober in English. And it doesn't mean sober in Romanian. If, you, if it was translated correctly, it would say, be abstinent. In other words, Peter is saying an abstinent lifestyle is a Christian lifestyle. Be abstinent from anything that's going to adversely affect the ability to gird up the loins of your mind. And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, what is the frontal lobe desire for optimal function? Carbohydrates are used almost exclusively by the brain for optimal function, and carbo natural carbohydrates are found in fruits, grains, nuts, and vegetables. Ellen White, speaking in the book Ministry of Healing, quotes those four food groups, the same four food groups that Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, tells us was the original diet for mankind. And she says, those four food groups impart a strength, a power of endurance, and what else? a vigor of intellect that are not afforded by a more complex and stimulating diet. And now there's plenty of evidence surfacing that a plant-based diet helps in regards to IQ, and it also helps in regards to judgment. However, it has to be plant-based, not carbs that are taken out of the plants and then concentrated and put in the form of sugar. In the 1960s, it was discovered that carbohydrates were best for the brain. And so they did studies with candy, thinking that might be good for the brain. And actually, it showed that those that were on a high sugar diet actually scored about a grade letter lower in uh, most uh, subjects. And uh, the reason for this is it was demonstrated to impair frontal lobe functions in school-aged children. We also know that that's true in adults. Arachidonic acid also decreases the ability it's present primarily in flesh foods and uh, decreases the synthesis and storage of acetylcholine, an important neurotransmitter in the brain. Speaking of meat, Ellen White says this, eating much flesh will diminish intellectual activity. Students would accomplish much more in their studies if they did what? Never tasted meat. When the animal part of the human nature is strengthened by meat eating, the intellectual power diminishes proportionately. And so it is best to get our nutrients from the plant foods. Interestingly, there's also a reverse association that's been recently shown in a study in Great Britain. A link between vegetarianism and intelligence. Children with high IQs when they are children are more likely to become vegetarians when they grow up. A study of more than 8,000 men and women age 30 whose IQs have been measured when they were 10 show that the higher their IQ at age 10, the greater their odds of becoming a vegetarian by age 30. For each 15-point rise in IQ scores in the study, the likelihood of being a vegetarian rose by 38%. Even after adjusting to factors such as social class, education, the link was still consistent. And this might underscore why studies re recently have shown that intelligence is linked to longevity. The higher your IQ is, the longer you are likely to live. And one of the reasons for that is the definition of intelligence is your capacity to learn, 
retain and apply knowledge. And so these people at age 10 had the capacity to learn, retain, and apply knowledge, so they were much more likely to have learned some things uh, in the scientific literature and in their exposure. They were much more likely to retain it and much more likely to apply it. And uh, thus, IQ uh, was a very important indicator. In fact, uh, for those of you that are vegetarian, sometimes because I'm a vegetarian, I'm in a social setting with others that they, they don't realize my background in health, et cetera, and they'll see that I'm ordering a vegetarian menu at the restaurant, sometimes they'll uh, ask, why are you a vegetarian? And sometimes, you know, you have to go into a complex explanation, et cetera, and go through all of this, but if you don't have a lot of time and they don't have a lot of time to listen to you, you now have a have a quick two-word answer that you can give them. Why are you a vegetarian? High IQ. <laughs> uh, tyramine actually uh, confuses brain cells um, significantly. Tyramine crosses the blood-brain barrier and uh, can actually cause neurotransmission in nerves that were not meant to be communicated with. Thus, it can be confusing. And tyramine is found abundantly in hard cheeses wines and rich foods, and one of the reasons why hard cheeses also should be avoided as far as best frontal lobe food. Ellen White says this, the sin of intemperate eating, eating too frequently, too much, and of rich unwholesome food does several things. She says it destroys the healthy action of the digestive organs, affects the brain, and perverts the judgment <laughs> preventing rational, calm, healthy thinking and acting. What area of the brain is she talking about there? The frontal lobe. Now here's her next statement. And this is a fruitful source of what? Church trials. So the argument in the church board meeting may not be due to what you think it's due to. It may be due to what the people ate before they got to the board meeting. <laughs> And no matter how much you try to explain something, because people are not thinking with their frontal lobes fully intact, you're not going to have unity uh, at that board meeting. In another place, she says it's, a, it's the most frequent cause of church trials. Then she says this, few understand how much their habits of diet have to do with four things. Their health. And, you know, there's still a disconnect today. People don't realize, a lot of people don't realize, that their health is directly dependent upon what they're putting into their bodies. It's dependent on other things as well, but it is dependent on that. If you understand how much their habits of diet have to do with their health, their characters, their usefulness in this world, and finally, few understand how much their habits of diet have to do with their eternal destiny. If it affects character and usefulness in this world, it stands to reason that it can even affect eternal destiny. And that's why God is interested in what you're eating and drinking. Uh, the Bible states very clearly that whatsoever you eat or whatsoever you drink, do what? Do all to the glory of God, to glorify him, to enhance that frontal lobe. The Lord is uh, concerned about those things because he realizes it can also affect us and even our success for him and our eternal destiny. Now I'm going into an area that is not what you put into your body as far as ingesting. It's the era of hypnosis, which has become more popular today. Hypnosis, this comes from a textbook that, that um, encourages hypnosis. And the textbook states, hypnosis attempts to cancel out frontal lobe functions and bring people into a trance in which they are highly suggestible. This is most easily accomplished by training the eyes to focus in on one object, the best object being a little flickering light. The person will record information and duties without interpretation or without frontal lobe activity. Now, it's important that the hypnotist be in charge of the flicker, but if you have your eyes focused in on one object and that object is irregularly flickering, Studies show within 90 seconds to at most three minutes, your brain waves turn into alpha wave brain waves, where your memory is still intact, your emotions are still intact, but you're no longer critically analyzing the information. The frontal lobe has been subdued. Now, a lot of people have a hypnotic instrument in their own home. What trains the eyes to focus in on one object and flickers? 
entertainment television. And what produces the flicker is the rapid scene of reference change. Now, if you're watching by screen today, you're not getting that effect because the average scene of reference changes at a much slower pace. In entertainment television, the average scene of reference changes every three seconds. So you see someone coming up to the door, you'll see the hand grasping the door, then you'll see the person behind the door, then you'll see a different angle of them knocking on the door, and et cetera. There's this constant camera switching that's going on in entertainment television. And within 90 seconds to three minutes, you'll go into alpha wave rhythm. This is why there have been over 3,000 studies done on the effects of entertainment television in the mind. Over 300 books have been written on the subject, and they all show a significant decline in frontal lobe function. It will increase daydreaming. It decreases creative ingenuity. Creativity has to do with the frontal lobe of the brain. It decreases interest in reading, decreases interest in learning, reduces discernment, trains in non-reaction when we should be reacting, increases aggressiveness when we shouldn't be reacting, reduces sensitivity to violence. It is also addictive, just like any frontal lobe suppressant. Anything that suppresses the frontal lobe of the brain has an addictive quality to it. Uh, and with entertainment television, if you're used to utilizing it on a regular basis and you go without it for 30 days, studies have shown you're going to tend to have an insomnia, anxiety, uh, particularly those first few days. Uh, and, uh, you know, it might be a good idea for this church. You know, we used to, as Adventist churches, put on five-day plans to stop smoking. What about a five-day plan to stop watching television? Um, help people to know what to substitute it with and not be able to have that withdrawal, et cetera. And then it takes away precious time for family, for achievement, and spiritual pursuits uh, as well. And it's, and it's clear it decreases IQ and frontal lobe function. And, in regards to music, what's that? The internet. Well, uh, entertainment internet can have that same type of effects, and entertainment, even video games, can have that same type of effect. So we, the, the new thing in the medical literature is entertainment screen time, they'll call it. Entertainment screen time in general has that uh, suppressant effect. Now, music enters the brain through its emotional regions. I mentioned this earlier, which include the temporal lobe and limbic system. From there, some kinds of music tend to produce a positive frontal lobe response that influences the will, moral worth, and reasoning power in a positive way. This is most characteristic of what we uh, call more traditional classical music. This is a picture I took myself of the Dallas Symphony Christmas concert. Uh, they hold it every year. Uh, normally two weeks in a row. It's every seat is sold out. They never advertise it. Uh, and they charge the highest price tickets uh, for this. Uh, it's a real spiritual feast. Uh, they're, they're singing very uh, spiritual numbers. They're quoting the Bible uh, there. It's quite a positive frontal lobe enhancement because of the, the uh, style of the music as well. That's very enjoyable, but yet it enhances the frontal lobe of the brain, fills you with reverence uh, and awe. Other kinds of music will evoke very little, if any, frontal lobe response, but will produce a large emotional response with very little logical or moral interpretation. And this is characteristic of the syncopated rock and roll rhythms, the boom cha type rhythms that instead of making you want to march, you just want to stand up and swing your hips. And that hip swinging music after it's played for, nine, again, it's between 90 seconds and three minutes, it will cause a suppressant effect on the frontal lobe of the brain, showing us that upbeat music is not necessarily uplifting music. That's one of the reasons why I come and speak at the Romanian church. I want my frontal lobe to be enhanced with the musical uh, aspect of things. And I've noticed, uh, at least every time I've come here, it's been frontal lobe enhancing music uh, that I've listened to. And it's enjoyable as well, so keep that up. Uh, don't ever be uh, tempted to go to the suppressant effect that may become more popular in some settings, but actually um, less advantageous in regards to frontal lobe uh, aspect is our concern. Interestingly, Ellen White spoke about music and its relationship to decision-making. Deci decision she said, the things you have described as taking place in Indiana, the Lord has shown me would take place just before the close of probation. She says, every uncouth thing will be demonstrated. There will be shouting with what? Drums, Drums music, and what? Yes. 
dancing. When you hear dance music played to religious words in a religious service, you are hearing the fulfilling of prophecy. She says this, the senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to do what? Make right decisions. That's the frontal lobe of the brain. And then she says this, and this is called the moving of the Holy Spirit. But it's obviously not the Holy Spirit that enhances frontal lobe function. It's a spirit that wants to decline the frontal lobe function so that deceptions can come in. In summarizing a number of studies in regards to brains optimizing music, it, uh, there are six aspects to it. Melodious, where it has a melody. It often is simple, but yet an attractive melody. Beautiful, non-dissident harmonies. Uh, if you have a, a concentration of the sevenths and the thirteenths, um, that produces a mysticism effect that actually is not frontal lobe enhancing. You can utilize that as a transition but not as the basis for the harmony, because uh, you can have music that isn't the syncopated rock and roll, but is still not the best as far as frontal lobe function is concerned. When the rhythms are straight, instead of syncopated, march rhythms will work. Onward Christian Soldiers is one of those marching type songs that can enhance the frontal lobe function. But the rhythm needs to be less prominent than the melody and the harmony. And it's often best if the music tells a story. You can almost hear the, or see the story take place as a result of the musical um, score and listening to that. That also is quite beneficial. On the other side of the equation, the non-beneficial type, Alvin Toffler talks about this. He's a secular communications expert. But he says, constant stimulation of the senses shuts down the analytical processes and ultimately shuts down the ability to face life rationally. This leads to escape techniques that involve withdrawal, apathy, and rejection of disciplined thinking when faced with difficult duties and decisions. And so you not only have syncopated rock and roll music, you have sensual images that people watch that are going right, one right after another in quick succession. We call it MTV. It causes a strong suppressant effect on the frontal lobe of the brain. And it will predictably lead to these things. Withdrawal, apathy, and rejection of what type of thinking? Disciplined thinking when faced with difficult duties and decisions. If we've wondered why there's a lack of disciplined thinking today, this is a large part of it. The constant stimulation of the senses. There's, quotes more fun things to do than ever before in human history. But many of these fun things decline the frontal lobe of the brain and have led us to the state that we're in. This was an interesting study just published last year. And now we're showing it in other ways as well. Compared with adults who watch less than two hours of TV a day, those who watched more than four hours had a 46% higher risk of death from all causes, 80% higher risk of cardiovascular death during just a six-year study period. Each hour spent in front of the TV per day raised a person's risk of death by cardiovascular disease by 18% and even risk of cancer by 9%. What we're showing is that whatever detracts from the frontal lobe of the brain not only detracts your ability as far as success in life and decision-making ability, it also decreases longevity, whether it comes from alcohol, tobacco, TV, uh, or um, even the poor music can produce a uh, decrease in longevity. So in summary, I encourage you to take care of your frontal lobe. Protect it from mechanical injury. Supply it with good oxygen through exercise, give it good nutrition as we've been talking about. Even getting adequate sunlight and vitamin D is important. Exercise it, just like a muscle, if we don't use it, we're going to lose it. And so we need to have that material that's going to exercise our frontal lobe of the brain daily. Control the inputs of what we're seeing and hearing. Correct distorted thoughts and prevent or control disease that affects it. I can think of no better way of stimulating it than the, what the people in Acts did. It says these were more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all what? Readiness of, Readiness of mind and searched the scriptures weekly, whether those things were so. Would that our people would search it weekly, but it actually was a daily exercise. This was an analysis. In other words, the frontal lobe was involved, whether those things were so. Analytical Bible study is very powerful in improving frontal lobe function. Ellen White says, the Bible, just as it reads, is to be our guide. 
Nothing is so calculated to enlarge the mind and strengthen the intellect as the study of the Bible. As the mind is brought to the study of God's word, the understanding will enlarge, the higher power will develop for the comprehension of high and ennobling truth. So I ask you here today, do you want to be more intelligent? Do you want to be more analytical? Do you want to make better decisions? Do you want to have a greater capacity to empathize with others? Do you want to have better discernment over what is right or what is not so right? Do you want to have a greater ability to see into the future and to reason from cause to effect? Do you want to have a greater ability to overcome an addiction if you have one? That requires frontal lobe function. And do you want to have a greater power to follow your conscience? And finally, do you want to be more open to understanding and doing the will of God? If you answer yes to any of those questions, I would encourage you to review your life habits and to see what you can do to actually significantly improve by habitual lifestyle habits the frontal lobe of your brain. Daniel chapter 1, uh, verse 8. In fact, I would encourage you, if you have your Bibles, let's just go ahead and open it to Daniel chapter 1. Every chapter of Daniel starts out with a disappointment and ends with an appointment. And uh, there is a transition, a key that turns it from disappointment to appointment. And uh, we're going to start with verse 8, which in this particular chapter is the one that is the transition point that shifts it from disappointment to appointment. It says, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Daniel decided that he was going to make a change in his lifestyle. And he was not going to follow the culture and even the mandates of the day. And it says he purposed in his heart. In other words, he stepped out in faith to follow God's plan. And you might say, well, you know, that was the king's meat. Uh, we don't have the king's meat here anymore. But, you know, just down the street, I saw a Burger King. Uh, right here, not too far away from the Romanian church. There's also Dairy Queen out there. Uh, there's Imperial Margarine. So that royal food is available to you today. And are you going to take the royal food? Are you going to take what is culturally acceptable? Are you, are you going to purpose in your heart? Verse 9 says, Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Notice, he first stepped out in faith and the Lord poured grace into his life. It says, the Lord, God, brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. When we step out in faith and follow God's plan, the Lord will pour grace into our life. And of course, we are saved. How are we saved? By grace, through faith. And so this is the salvation story right here in verse 8 and 9. We're stepping out in faith. The Lord is pouring grace. Now, what was the, uh, what was the after consequence? Verse 12, in fact, the American Medical Association recently stated that this was the first prospective epidemiological human trial ever recorded in human history. Daniel was the one who proposed it. A change was made and a comparison was made. And verse 12 says that after 10 days, they looked and they were far better looking. Uh, and, uh, and so their diet was permanently changed. Plant foods and water instead of the other way around. And verse 16 and 17 16 says they took it away, but 17 says, as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And verse 20 says, when test time came in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. Their wisdom was far higher. And I'd like to encourage you that this health message is for everyone, but it's particularly for the youth. Sometimes we think the health message is just when we get old and get diseased, and then we may need to change. 
But Ellen White says, Dear youth, God calls upon you to do a work which through his grace you can do. Show a purity of taste, appetite, and habits that bears comparison with who? Yes. With Daniel's. God will reward you with four things, she says. Calm nerves, a clear brain, unimpaired judgment, keen perceptions. The youth of today whose principles are firm and unwavering will be blessed with health of body, mind, and soul. Ellen White in the book Mind, Character, and Personality says the Lord has given man capacity for continual improvement and has granted him all possible aid in the work. Through the provisions of divine grace, we may attain almost to the excellence of angels. That is what is possible if we follow the plan of Daniel. Now I'd like to close with three texts. One is in Revelation 18, it tells us how Babylon will fall. And it asks why so many people got confused about Babylon and joined the Babylonian ranks. And the answer is given, the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee. This is after Babylon falls. The voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. And then it asks the question, why did so many people fall? For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy what? Sorceries were all nations deceived. The word sorcery in Greek is pharmakia. And what John is saying here is it's the drugging down of the brain that sets up the deception. And as I just mentioned, it requires more than drugs. I mean, it's not just drugs that have this effect. There's entertainment screen time. There's diet. There's lots of things that can suppress the frontal lobe of the brain. But the setup, the reason why there's an assault globally on the frontal lobe of the brain is there's a setup for the great deception of people getting deceived and going into Babylon. And by the way, this also tells us you can make a lot of money by suppressing people's frontal lobe. It's the easiest money to be made. And uh, there's a lot of people that have gotten wealth. The great merchants of the earth have gotten wealthy through that way. But that's not the way that God approves us to get wealthy. Then this text, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a what? Living sacrifice. A lot of people would think that this is a sacrificial lifestyle to give up some of the things I've been talking about or to eat a better way. But in reality, Paul called it a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which he says is not extremism. He calls it what? Your reasonable service. And then he says, be not conformed to this world. Not in its diets, its cultures, its customs, its entertainment, its sports. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When we step out in faith and follow the Lord's plan, it may seem sacrificial at first, but we're actually not going to sacrifice anything. We open the room to a better, a far better way of living. And by coming here today, you have walked in to the largest room in the world. And that is the room for improvement. And I would encourage you to take advantage of this room and indeed improve your lifestyle. My closing text is Proverbs 8. For wisdom is better than rubies. And all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. If you put up anything, mansions, homes, the largest bank account, the most money, whatever is desirable to you, and you have that choice versus enhancing the frontal lobe of your brain and becoming wiser, what should you choose? Wisdom, the richest man who ever lived, tells us wisdom is better than rubies.